and welcome to another episode of Uva. In today's episode, we have an amazing topic. We are going to talk about chaos engineering with Adrian Horsby. If you want to know more about serverless, cloud computing, or software engineer practices in general, subscribe to my channel in the red button below. I post two or three videos every week. So let's get started. <laughs> Today we have an interview and this is another episode on my series This is not a podcast We are interviewing Adrian Hornsby He's an expert on cost engineering and uh, architecture resiliency and all these interesting things that are super important when merging serverless applications when building distributed systems So let's go to the interview Hello, Adrian. Uh, you're my guest today, and I hope I say your surname correctly, Adrian Hornsby. Yes. Yes. Ten Good. points. Hi, Marcia. Thanks for having me on your channel. It's a pleasure. I'm a huge fan of your channel, actually. Yes. Uh, you were recruiting me, so. <laughs> well, that's a small detail. <laughs> yes. So can you tell a little bit what you do? Uh, well, you work at AWS, but a little bit more about your role and right. I don't know. So <laughs> about me. All right. So I joined AWS about four and three or four months ago. No, not four years <laughs> and three or four months yeah. ago. Yeah. <laughs> time flies. Uh, <laughs> I joined actually as a solutions architect and um, we have something quite interesting at Amazon. And uh, I think that's always been fun is that very early on we think about uh, carrier plans and things like this. And back then, I had the manager, and which was called Martin. Uh, I love Martin, and uh, we had a very nice discussion. And uh, I told to him that I wanted to eventually become evangelist. Um, it was by, actually by that time there was not that many evangelists. No, so there was actually really Danilo, uh, Ian Massingham, and a bunch of other. I think a couple of other. It was a team led by Carlos, which was back then the the manager. And I knew Ian um, from there, right? And I was like, oh, it would be fun to do like what those guys are doing. <laughs> so maybe in a long-term plan, I was like, oh, maybe five years after being at AWS, this might be something I would like to do. And uh, and then, you know, my year, a uh, year went by. And at the end of uh, one year... That's five years in AWS time. I Ian... <laughs> Exactly. Ian had become the the manager of the evangelist team in AMEA, so in Europe, and opened a position in the Nordics, which was becoming, you know, started to grow already back then. And my manager looked at me and was like, well, do you really want to wait five years? There's a position for the Nordics and, you know, you should go for it. So I went for it and um, applied for the position and then uh, eventually became an evangelist. A technical evangelist associated with the Nordics eventually, uh, initially, and that means that working with the Nordic team at making sure the events are uh, are targeting developers and make sure the summit is also targeting <laughs> developers the right way and at least you know, and I also creating content myself, right? Uh, and back then I was already very interested in architectures. What and is the difference? I think it's an interesting question I never ask out loud. What is the difference of a solution architect and as an evangelist? It's not right. related to cost engineering, but why not to ask? <laughs> right. no, but, I mean, solutions architects are uh, helping named accounts. So they have accounts associated with with them. And there actually is an account team that helps this account like let's say, uh, achieve better better architectures and, and things like this, right? And the evangelist maybe comes before that and is a, a seed planter, I always say. It's like, okay, you know, you plant an ID and then the solutions architect and the account team go and develop that ID into a big tree, right? We inspire and, people. <laughs> right, and it's, it's, it's not... I'm uh, I'm careful with the word inspiring because I like it's, that uh, word. it's a lot of uh, of pressure. But I would say just give it, give an ID, right? Uh, uh, or connect dots that maybe okay. you know um, people didn't do it, and also like remove the noise from everything. There's so much stuff going on, right? It's hard for people to follow 
everything what is happening, all the new services. So if we can remove the noise and kind of help customers kind of see the light and, and, and mm -hmm. see something that they are interested in, like, I think it's great. And this is actually why I went to, then after three years as an, uh, a general evangelist, I went to specialist role because I think this is this is where people kind of are, are going as well naturally is they they want to follow somebody that let's say is more into architecture or is more into serverless. I mean, you your it's, brand is it's serverless. It's so hard to know everything inside AWS. I'm yeah. studying now for certification so I can learn more because I'm very specific on the serverless area and and it's such a broad amount of things that I don't right. know how you can be a generalist. <laughs> the, the people that follow you expect serverless type of content and therefore you are basically uh, making, uh, creating a light path, you know, for them in, in removing all the noise. So you, that's what I, I hope. Think, <laughs> yeah. And you are doing this, you know, and, I, and so that's also why I went to to architecture and maybe more, even more into resiliency and safety engineering, resiliency engineering and chaos engineering. And, you know, and because I think there's so much going on, uh, but this is the stuff I love. And yeah. this and is it's the stuff a that... a huge problem in distributed systems. That... Right. Yeah. Like it's, you know, there's so many things that can go wrong and they <laughs> always kind of do. So it's like, how do you design systems to avoid or not to avoid failures because you can't avoid no. failures, but to deal with failures, right? Exactly. And, uh, it's called like you know, partial failure mode in, in a way. We can talk a little bit about yeah. that later as well. But... Failing elegantly. <laughs> graceful. I like graceful. to use the word graceful yes. degradation. You know, yeah, it's exactly. like, oh, I'm gracefully degrading. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's, that's uh, something that a lot of people don't think when they go either to serverless architecture, that they are might maybe moving from a more like traditional one box thing to just, oh, it's so simple. You put a lambda there, but then you're getting into this world of distributed architecture where things move around and... You don't have right. control of things anymore and things can fail and you don't have control. <laughs> and, and it's also they fail in ways that uh, maybe are harder to predict because it's not you managing it. So you have to, you also have to do a lot of work actually. Yeah. And, and I mean, and chaos engineering works also very much into the serverless world because there are a lot of unknowns there as well. Like, you know, if a service fail, what are the characteristic of that failure and exactly. you know, how do you prepare for it? Exactly. So, what is chaos engineering? <laughs> right. It's a good question. Um, so, this I, I would say I would start with the benefits because I think it will help. It will help understand what it is. Um, first thing, it's not about creating chaos. I think uh, the word chaos engineering does. It's a good marketing term, like but serverless. It, yeah, but it doesn't do it justice, and especially it can be a little bit scary because if you tell. Uh, your uh, manager or your CEO that, <laughs> hey, I'm going to do chaos engineering. He's going to look at you with big eyes and say, why? We have enough chaos in production. Don't do this. What are you doing? Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, that's not chaos, right? So chaos engineering, the benefit of it, because that's where I want to start, is, like, like you said, things fail in... In, in ways we can't really understand, especially in complex systems, right? The, the number of interactions between ser services, between systems is so huge, right? That it's impossible for the brain to comprehend that. Um, and there are a lot of unknowns, right? So chaos engineering is trying to surface some of those unknowns. And we do that in a control environment, right? So instead of having those unknown happening in production <laughs> you know and, and, and happening in uh, in uh, at 3 a.m during the night we create an environment a safe environment exactly. that, where we can do some well let's say failure injection or create conditions for some of the unknowns to surface and then learn about it exactly. and the benefit one of the third benefit of this is 
by creating those conditions in a prepared environment, we actually gain confidence in our system, but also our tools and the teams, right? And uh, I think that's so important because so many right. people have tools there that they don't know how they work. So when they have any problem, they're monitoring, they go for the first time to really understand their monitoring system or yeah. their observability system. And they don't know how to dig into it. They don't right. know how to find information. And maybe they don't have backups in place. They thought that they do, but they don't know how to recover them. <laughs> yeah, and, and let me ask you a question. When was the last time you debugged the system in production, right? You know, that, that's the thing. Like, we by, I mean, 10 years ago, the cloud or software systems were not as reliable as they were now. So there were actually more outages, and more outages mean more practices, right? So you were getting used to those tools. And uh, now it's become really available, pretty reliable, and that means we add skill atrophy. You know, like yeah. we lose some of the knowledge that we had back then because we do it less. Right? Yeah, and when things, when shit hit the fans, that I love that expression because it's very descriptive, you might, it might not happen again ever. And you don't know, it might be always a different error because I remember when I was working in production systems that were in the traditional type of environment, that little box, they fail, but we knew more or less what could be the reason. There were more or less three or four reasons. We patch it and then they appear <laughs> again. But no, it can happen that it fails in one way and it never fails that way again. So That's you true. are like, you really need to be confident on understanding your, your system. And, and, right. and, <laughs> and even if it fails in the same way, but it's separate, separated by six months. Yeah. You just don't remember really necessarily the tools or you're not as comfortable. And, and I always use the analogy of firefighters. I love the, this analogy because <laughs> firefighters spend 80% plus of their time training to fight fire in a control environment. And they do this to have an intuition, right? So that when they go and fight the real fire, they don't have to think. And that's the same when you do an outage, when you want to fight an outage of the system. If you think a lot, the, your mean time to recovery is going to be massive. And right? it's free at, in the morning on a right. Saturday. It's even worse. You're hungover so you maybe that, or, or tired right. or you're not prepared for taking that. You don't have your computer next to you. I don't know. So many things can happen. But... Right. So you need to be developing this intuition, right? So chaos engineering by creating small outages, small controlled outages in a safe environment also limits the skill atrophy. And I love that because it's something that is so important in terms of confidence and a, a team that is more confident will eventually take more risk in terms of uh, innovation and things like this. So I think it's uh, that kind of summarize a little bit this chaos engineering. So it's not breaking things without a purpose is pretty much the opposite. It's actually, it can be breaking things, but injecting failures in a system, in a controlled environment through a very, very well-planned experiment uh, to surface a non-condition and to make the system more resilient to failures. Uh, I mean, if you think about the scientific method, right? That, <laughs> yeah. that we learned at school, that's exactly this. You make an hypothesis on the system, and then you go in to verify that hypothesis and then full circle, right? And uh, that's pretty much what it is. And it's very different from testing because a lot of people think that chaos engineering is testing. Well, maybe we can consider some type of testing. I don't know what, what is your point. No, so if you think about testing, uh, testing, I'll tell you, I write a test. A is A uh, equal, does A equal B? Assert A equal B, right? That's a test because yeah. you know a possible condition that you want A to be, to be, right? So that's a test, A equal B. But chaos engineering, you want to surface things you don't know. Like what's the effect of shutting down or adding 300 milliseconds latency into the system? You can't say an assert A equal <laughs> something because you don't know. There's so many different parts. It can have an effect on the UI. It can have an effect on the back end, on the database on your alert systems, it can have an effect on the deployment. Tons of things can go wrong, so you can't really test it. So chaos engineering test is two different things. Now, they do, if you do one, 
and not the other, you're losing it, something, yeah. right? So you always, you need to keep testing because testing is not chaos engineering. And if you do chaos engineering and not testing, then you have something doing wrong as well, yeah. right? And you will find a lot of things that are avoidable when you get to chaos engineering if you don't test. So it's like... Exactly. And I mean, testing is great, and but I think also chaos engineering, and you again, you don't have to do it in production, actually. You, it is a very good way to think about systems because it very often we develop system with the idea that they work but I we always it, develop systems with the idea that they work right but <laughs> i challenge you to think about developing a system with the idea that everything fails and then how do you make it robust right and how do you make it more reliable and resilient and all that kind of stuff or available as well right yeah. so if you think if you develop a function and instead of thinking ah oh, this function is going to work think about hey this function is going to fail so no how can you make it not fail That's or right. handle it right and so then you make circuit breakers you can use caching you can use graded degradation for example your function can't connect to the database well fail mm -hmm. but What does it mean? Like, how do you fail? Maybe you go and retrieve something from the cache, or then you develop a system that can return static data or just return cute dogs, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or something that doesn't break the one that called this function. Or... Exactly. Yeah, so something like that. Yeah. But it's, it's an interesting, I think, thinking about failures. And I always talk about failure-oriented development. And I think it's a, it's a good way to... Uh, so do you have some kind of best practices for trying to handle failures in a graceful way? Well, first, you can't always handle it gracefully. Uh, because sometimes if you want to do things gracefully, it adds so much complexity into the systems, right? So there's first is fail fast, right? Uh, so notice that something is failing and then fail fast. So, you know, timeouts, for example, are very important or max retries. If your system <laughs> fails and you have like thousands of unlimited retries, well, then you're in deep yeah. trouble, right? So fail fast, maybe five max retries and then just fail, right? It's okay to fail sometimes. You can't always fail gracefully or degrade gracefully. So fail fast and then try to degrade. If If, for example, you're using a database which has a master and some read replicas, you can always think maybe, well, I could maybe try to go into a read-only mode, all right? Or then use stuff from the cache, right? For example, a lot of things on the internet is from cache, right? Uh, so, yeah, things like this. Uh, it, uh, it always is a good discussion to, with everyone in the team <laughs> to think about this kind of stuff because it, 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 it opens up a lot of possibilities. Right? Yeah, and I think sometimes it can be the discussion of over-engineering by adding, like, what is the limit on, on, on the amount of extra code or in extra kind of layers of security that you need to add to your system and not over engineer it because the more code and the more things you add the more complexity you are to the system and it becomes like a snowball of <laughs> right yeah no it's super important to keep the system uh, i would say simple and yeah. simple is not easy no. right you know like it's not always easy to do uh, so as i said like sometimes you just can't gracefully degrade but just at least don't fail brutally, like uh -huh. catch the error, catch it fast, and then, you know. I think building error. simple systems is more a principle of software engineer than chaos engineer in general. Like I like this Uncle Bob in his book, he was, uh, in one of his books, he was take, talking about that he has to build this system and uh, they asked him to, to, to make a system and he, instead of thinking of putting it in a database, he started using files. And he said, I will go and use a database whenever it really needs a database. And basically, he was able to go until the end of the, all the features without exactly. adding a database. And he was saying that sometimes we just take decisions because we think that is the decision that we need to go through. But sometimes trying to make it as simple as possible might look very strange, like why you're using files, but then it's so much easier to handle the files than yeah. to handle the databases. Is that okay? I mean, it's the, <laughs> best, the easiest way to build a website on exactly. AWS is S3. <laughs> exactly. No database, you can put <laughs> everything into S3, status file, even dynamic, some, some dynamic files and uh, you know, do JavaScript queries exactly. to S3 and then 
use a WAF and then use the CloudFront and things like this, and then you're good to go. And a lot of a uh, lot of the complexity is because people are using architectures that are 15, 20 years old yeah. and they but, haven't changed. But, but that's something I think also quite hard to know all the services and understand okay. what is available for you. That's a topic for a different chat. <laughs> but well, that's the topic for evangelists yeah. to make it simple, right? You wanted to have the difference between essays and evangelists. Evangelist yeah. is create things like you know, yeah. or present things in an easy way. Remove and it's the not, noise. <laughs> it's a simple way, not easy. A simple yeah. way. And it's not easy. No. So I think there's two categories of failures if we talk about the cloud. We have the AWS services because we are talking about AWS, but the cloud services in general, and then the third party services that are not provided by the cloud. Maybe we can start talking a little bit on how to handle failure for the cloud services, like how you make your Dynamo fail or API gateway right. or something like that. So there's actually a say? lot more <laughs> places or levels of failures, but I think you're okay. talking about uh, AWS versus other third parties yeah. um, but let, let's think about AWS first and the, the kind of failure modes there because there's quite a few right and I think a lot of people think about failures they think about infrastructure failures and things like this but actually there's a lot of things on there it starts at the infrastructure can go to the network and then, then, then to the uh, application and then deployment failures but actually it also goes to people right there's always people <laughs> there and it's not necessarily to blame people is because organizations have processes they have knowledge they have uh, uh, cultures that you know can create failures uh, because the lack of process is often uh, something that can lead to failure right I mean uh, I've seen uh, I've seen I've seen um, outages because escalation path were not maintained when someone quit the organization oh, yeah. left. And or there was no process for that. And then there was a, a Benin alert that was not caught, not escalated, that became a lot bigger a couple of hours later and then eventually a massive outage, right? Through cascading failures. But it those those things could have been prevented. Would there have been a process that would have, you know, noticed that there's something wrong in the escalation exactly. that is not updated or something like that. Anyway. So infrastructure, network, application, deployment, and people, that's not only AWS, it's actually pretty much anywhere. It's the same for third parties. Uh, now, when you talk about failure modes with uh, AWS and third party, like, okay, how do we handle our failures? Uh, and how do you protect yourself from others, people's failures? Uh, it's a good question. <laughs> I, I, I would say... Um, Unfortunately, the, the, because of the network and because networks are subject to physic, physical laws that you can't deal with, and, and very often it goes through the internet, actually dependencies are often the ones that fail, right? So I think when you develop a system on AWS or anywhere and you call remote services, that's often eventually where an outage, or it's an easy place for an outage yeah. to actually grow. Um, I mean, an easy way to do this, okay, again, it's not easy. Uh, a simple way to handle this kind of failure is through circuit breaker, for example, right? So if I'm A and I'm calling B and B fails uh, and we are in a distributed system and all my other service try to call B, if I fail once or twice or three times, maybe not all the hundred services... What question? Need yeah. So we do that for Dynamo, for example. Should we add circuit breakers in our application? Uh, um, it's a good practice to uh, add okay. circuit breakers. Um, no, I mean, it's, <laughs> it, it depends. It, it depends what you're going to do. And again, you want to you wanna add circuit breakers mostly in distributed systems, right? Uh, if, you have, if you have thousands or... A thousand, two thousand lambda function calling DynamoDB, right? And say ten of your lambda functions are failing. Should you still call Dynamo nine hundred and ninety times because every of every one of your function will fail, right? And so, how you share state between those two thousand lambda functions calling Dynamo? It's a oh, <laughs> 
you're the serverless expert, so you should talk about that. You could use you could use caching. You could use you know other stuff. The problem is then, well, that caching layer can also fail, and you can use the temporary file maybe to. And I've actually never really developed a, a concurrent circuit breaker on Lambda. It's a good. Uh, it would be interesting thing to do. But... I'm just asking from the voice of the audience and and my perplexity because I never put anything between my lambdas and Dynamo. I just yeah. trust Dynamo. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's fine because because it's uh, it, it rarely is gonna fail, right? Uh, and if it fails, you maybe can handle it nicely on the function level. Uh, but for example, you know, like for a bit more complex systems, like th there is a need to uh, to add some circuit breakers. Uh, I think it. At least it's a pattern to know. Yeah, I use it a lot uh, when calling third-party services a circuit right. breaker. That's yeah. kind of my go-to because you never know how, I don't know, the Facebook API will respond. Exactly. They might and, throttle you because they don't and like they you change, and, and they, they change it. it. <laughs> and, and you might have all kind of things. So at, in AWS, I trust. So I usually never put much things in general. So why do you trust? I mean, Because I work for you guys. Uh, no, but, but in general, because I put all my infrastructure there, I kind of think that it's inside the same network, it's inside the same region, so there is less... Theoretically, everything will fail. I know, I, mean, I everything know. Everything can fail, and but... it might happen once, so, I mean... <laughs> Now, if it happens once in 10 years, is it worth it to, uh, exactly. to create a, a circuit breaker? Maybe not. Uh, but, I mean, again, if you, if you have a framework that gives you easy you know, uh, access to the pattern very easily, why not? Oh, you know? yeah. I like the, the accelerator from Dynamo. I don't know what happens if that fails, but, well, at least that's yeah. a cache in front of Dynamo to, to, to use. And it's a cache through, so if it yeah. fails, it's, it's, you, can, you can have problems because, well, it's actually the, the DAX that then exactly. takes care of calling DynamoDB. Yeah. But you, you can have then, you can yourself have a failover and yeah. say, Oh, if DAX doesn't work, then maybe I'll try to return something else or from, you know, from S3 or, uh, I mean, it's something that you can think of as an engineer. What yeah. are the, uh, what are the possibilities? But again, if, you know, if it fails once every five years and you have to engineer things for 50 hours okay. to make that work, maybe it's not work. That's it's what I was right. saying at the beginning. That's the over-engineering part sometimes it gets to the, the the way like maybe dynamo is not something that fails very often but the facebook api if you are connecting for free they might change it you are might be throttled there is way more chances that that kind of yeah and and again it's because you go over the internet right and okay, internet, that. That, that's the big risk right when you're on on the network i mean when you are inside AWS, you're not over the internet. We have our own network. We have a, uh, actually there's a beautiful talk from James Hamilton from Reinvent 2016 that actually goes into describe how we build our internal network infrastructure. I want the link so I can put it in the description box. Yeah, and uh, I mean th these are great to to look at, and so it's not over the internet. We have very very controlled network, controlled infrastructure, redundant. Uh, uh, so it's very unlikely that it will fail, and it well, it did fail it a few times fail. in no, some, then, but some areas, not. but it's maybe once in every. I mean, I've seen two outages in twelve years that are really linked to network failures. So is it worth uh, an hour, uh, two or three days of engineering? Maybe not. So fail and I think also uh, depends on what you're building. If you're building something that is keeping someone alive, maybe you put a little bit right. more effort. But if you're just exactly. building an app to deliver food, maybe you don't give a fuck. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I think you got a good point, right? Is, is, is life, is life dependent on your food application? Maybe not. Yeah. This time of the, the, the life we are right now, yes, it does for many of us. <laughs> I like cooking myself, so uh, it doesn't, for me it doesn't, so you yeah. see. Again, but but a... that's what I was asking about the difference between the AWS services and the third-party services, because I think they are inherently different because of the environment they run. AWS inside a control space that our inf application is already running in there if we are running in Lambda or in EC2, yeah. so it's kind of, in a way... But it's, it's simply because of the link, right? It's the okay. internet, right? And yeah. the link, because you go over the internet, 
and the internet is made of hundreds of layers of weird things. There's different routes, there's different routers, link. There's so many things that can change. So, I mean, the, the number of things that can go wrong over the internet is so much bigger than what can go wrong inside an AWS data center. So it's probably better to invest in there first and make sure that uh, our dependency on over the internet is, is, is rock solid. Yeah, You're yeah. right. That's, that's what I, I put my effort, but I think, sure. You're I right. No, no, but it, and it makes sense because, you know, the number of, uh, of things that can go wrong with the internet is much bigger than what is on AWS. But if you have a framework that makes it easy for you. What is a good framework to, to handle like uh, circuit breakers and, and do this in a simpler way? Do right. Do something so, to recommend? Well, yeah, the, I mean, the, the most famous one is Hystrix yeah. from, uh, from, you know, uh, Netflix, uh, uh, though it's not maintained anymore, actually. I used it in the, when I was a Java developer a million right. years ago, and it was pretty good, but I, I don't know, for Lambda, I, I tend to be... Uh, a... To be honest, I've never used it in Lambda because yeah. I think Lambda is a case of failing fast, right? Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's easier just to fail fast and, and, and see, especially it's even, you know, it's even driven, right? So a Lambda is way more even driven than any other any other program programming paradigm. So in event driven, if you have failures, well, very often then you can't go further, right? So it's better just to fail fast, and you know, and then it's, can you catch this error and then you know do something else, try to fix it, or maybe you have some redundancy somewhere. I don't know. Yeah. So yeah. it's interesting. Um, uh, architectural, uh, architectural question. I think so. I like. I, I have tried use step functions many times for retries and things, and handling that outside of my Lambda code. So that's something okay. I, I kind of like when if I'm calling a third-party API and my Lambda is only using that, then I use the step functions functionality for retries. That's that's interesting. Know, yeah. One way, but it's not a circuit breaker. But at least you can kind of. Oh, it's a state machine, right? Exactly. So, uh, so you so can it, have some kind of state there. So. Uh, it's a. Uh, I mean, a circuit breaker is a mini state machine in a yeah. way because, like, you know, that it shares this, its state with other parties. So, in a way, kind of that function is is that functionality. It's a cool. It's good. Yeah. Yes. So, if we talk about developing an application and things like that, how you can start thinking early on to prevent these failures, either from your development, for your build process, or your even the deployment stage, if there's some tricks that you can start having early on to prevent? <laughs> yeah, I get this uh, this question asked a lot. Uh, can, I, can I have a magic pill? Yes, for vitamin after, D, for example, everything? for our services. Um... Right, so I would say first, actually, like everything, uh, it's a learning curve, right? So there, there, are, there are general rules, and I think reading books is uh, one of the first Role is Do you have some game. blog post with books that you recommend? Right. So, I mean, my favorite book, and by far, is called Release It. Release It. Um, and there's now a second edition out of it. So I, I'll say this is the Bible for anything which is distributed systems uh, to understand how to de de develop with, their, uh, with that. Um, I did write some blog posts specific to AWS, so you can see that on Medium. Uh, but I mean, the... Yeah, that's learning at least the general cases of, of, of you know, software development and how things fails is, is definitely uh, interesting. There are books around chaos engineering as well that goes into a long way in explaining all that stuff. Uh, the first book on chaos engineering was done by folks from Netflix and yeah. I always recommend that book. I think it's great. Uh, since then, there's been quite a few written uh, depending on... Um, who, who is behind, uh, you know, um, yeah. so, I mean, but general, general principle, I, I would say always read a lot um, and, and trying to gain some ideas of uh, how things fail and what are the, the, the general failure, read, you know, so like uh, postmortems, there's, there's quite a few postmortems out there, and there's books also on incident management, on safety engineering. Then once you have kind of a solid background around this, then I would say doing things by hand is great. Um, I always 
I always, always, always tell people to start chaos engineering on their own laptop, you know, um, simply because it makes you think about things differently. I mean, I love Docker. When Docker was released, I loved using it as a as a small distributed system because you can launch multiple containers through Docker Compose and you can, you know, see interaction between services and then you can start playing with uh, with few of them, like actually use circuit breakers or just do a Docker stop of your mm-hmm. container and see how do you handle this or, uh, you know, like uh, do uh, some uh, DNS uh, attack on your laptop and see uh, can you recover from that or uh, do you use a service discovery system that actually handles this gracefully. Um, you know, do some denial of services. Like there's a, a cool, uh, a cool um, uh, command called the WRK that allows you to do a lot of this kind of load testing. And load testing is is one way to create a failure, right? It, yeah. So load testing is not the chaos engineering experiment. It's just the failure injection part. Is you actually stress the system. And um, stress ng is another one. And I think TC- in the cloud, at least for me, that's always when I'm working on a system, I always do load testing and people are like, why serverless scales automatically? Yes, but you have so many, at least soft limits in different services that sometimes don't match the load. Like you might have a thousand lambdas and then some amount of cog- and Cognito and Dynamo and things like that. And when you start stressing the system, then you yep. start seeing the whole thing turning red. And it's like, okay, I need to raise my soft right. limits here, my soft limits here. <laughs> yeah, and, I mean, without testing, for example, back in the days when you had Lambda and VPC, it created an ENI, which allocated some IP addresses. Yeah, exactly. And these IP addresses, they counted for the max IP address you could have in an account. And sometimes people would hit that limit yeah. without in production because they wouldn't have tested. Exactly. Uh, you would have done load testing and you have checked the scale before you wouldn't have that, that kind of limit. So, I mean, you cur- by doing load testing, it's it's kind of an experiment. Now, what chaos does, chaos engineering does, it does this failure injection in a control environment. So we, we think, okay, what's the hypothesis? What is it that we want to, to verify? How do we verify it? What are the- That's monitoring- kind of the test plan in a way. Right. It's a test plan, and then it's a scientific experiment. Exactly. You make an hypothesis, you include tests, and then you go and verifying it, and then you know try to uh, try to think about limiting the blast radius as well. And this is where we talk about immutable deployment and what you mean by limiting the blast radius. I think that's an important concept, maybe to deep dive a little bit. Right. So blast radius is how many customers are impacted by a failure, right? So when you do failure injection, it's very important to think what is the maximum number of people that might be impacted by your experiment? <laughs> right? When you do a chaos engineering experiment, you want to verify that your system is resilient. So you have a steady state of your system, you do the experiment, and you don't want that steady state to vary, right? If that steady state changes during the experiment, it means something is wrong in the system. It's not behaving the way you expect. Now, when it doesn't behave well, how many people are impacted, right? And limiting the blast radius is super, super important, especially at the beginning, because, well, things will go wrong. <laughs> Especially at the beginning, because you won't think about everything. So your first chaos experiment might actually really break things. So you want to do always the chaos experiments in production, even if you can do it in staging or in other environments, because nowadays with infrastructure as code, we can have replicas of our production environments. So. Well, that's, a, that's a interesting. It's big debate with a lot of people <laughs> now. When I speak with customers, they never, ever, ever will do chaos engineering in production first. So even if we or anyone thinks it should happen in production, realistically, it never does because people are... Afraid? Not, you don't know it? <laughs> no, they're not confident. It's exactly. not that they're afraid. Is they have not built the entire confidence into the system because they haven't. They know things can go wrong, right? And this is why they go into chaos engineering is they want to improve their confidence. So you always start, you know... Uh, in test environment because you also need to learn how to use the tool. You need to know what is this tool for, how to use it, how to limit the blast radius, how to 
I mean, it's like anything. Exactly. You need to understand it before deploying it in mm-hmm. production. You don't just say, oh, yeah, Netflix or Amazon or Adrian say we should do failure injection in production. Let's go and break a database in production. No. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. So, yeah, you need to gain confidence into your tool. Because I hear practice. sometimes these conference people speaking, yes, you need to go and do it in production. That sounds like not really inspiring for anybody to get into no. this if you just know. And, it, and it's great. It gives you <laughs> likes on Twitter. And it's, you know, it, it, and it, and again, why people say that, and, and they are right in a way, but yeah. why people say that is because production is always different, right? So it doesn't mean that if you... It, the thing is, if you test in, in your local laptop, in dev, in staging, in, get, in beta, in gamma, yeah. it doesn't mean that it's not going to fail in production because production has... Traffic the, from production. Exactly, right? But it's not... The point is not that. The point is to gain confidence. Exactly. Right? And to it's gain the training wheels. <laughs> Sorry? It's your training wheels when you're little and you're right. ready to bike. Right. You know? Train stuff. And then you say, okay, now we, are, we really understand the tool. We really understand how to use it. We understand how to deploy it. We understand how to monitor it. We understand the failure mode of the possible injection. We have the right blast radius. All right. We know it's going to be different in production, but we've gained so much knowledge by doing all the previous things. And you haven't got the knowledge of how it will break production because <laughs> that's different. But it's nonsense, to be honest. <laughs> and it's a, almost a suicide mission to ask anyone to start in production. The goal eventually is to come as close as possible as production. I always, I, always, I, I love... I love the principle of uh, the immutable deployments. Uh, it's called canary deployment, right? It's a way of deploying an experiment in a, in a system in production, but move only very, very small percentage of the traffic to that. So That's available have... in Lambda, for example, if you right. do a so safe you can deployment. Do it through Elias, uh, yeah. uh, weighted Elias, and API Gateway has the same things. Uh, ALBs have also uh, weighted yeah. uh, weighted target groups. R- Route 53 has weighted uh, um, routing. So a lot of systems, I wrote a big blog post around Canary deployment. It's in, in the immutable infrastructure context, but that's exactly what you need to do when you deploy a chaos experiment in production. It's also, you need to start super small. Like, you know, how can you... <laughs> How can you, what kind of traffic should you send to your chaos experiment? Well, first, maybe don't send paying customers. Right? <laughs> yeah. Send, send the internal uh, people. Like, uh, you know, if, we, if you deploy a team, uh, if you deploy an application, maybe you have a team of engineers working with you. Well, maybe send that yeah. traffic to the uh, chaos engineering uh, deployment or you know you have a canary with the, the chaos engineering experiment with maybe one or two percent of traffic exactly. only send I mean, non-paying customers then maybe you want to send only you know uh, uh, free free customers uh, or, not or some that maybe enroll in some beta program because right. there's all kind of customers sometimes people it, like to try things and exactly and and this is this is exactly what we do at amazon as well when we launch new yeah. services right we always go into a beta in production yeah. and we ask people to if they are willing to do this and then we and, can and test it's always and then... funny because people are like why p- things are behind the registration page because it's important you are kind of consenting that basically this is something we are trying out it might change yeah, exactly so and the don't like it's don't, not, don't, don't use it in production <laughs> <that>. <laughs> you know what I mean? like yeah. so i mean having this kind of uh, uh thinking what kind of traffic you want to send to your chaos experiment at the beginning makes total sense eventually when you've become so confident after a couple of years of three you know three four five years of doing very good chaos experiment then you can maybe afford to do chaos experiments on your customers, paying customers constantly like Netflix did, right? Or like yeah. we do at Prime Video as well, uh, you know. But, hey, there is so much work to do and, and, you know, and so much things that 
you know, can be done and uh, initially. And what kind of team is the one in charge of chaos engineering? Is it like, because in general, some companies have like testing and then engineers that are working on the features. Is the same engineers working on the features that should be doing the chaos engineering or? It depends what kind of organizations you have. So for example, uh, so for example, Amazon, we use two pizza teams, right? Yeah. So, those teams, they do everything. everything. They, they, they write the service, they deploy it, they maintain it, they do the case experiment. Now they don't build the tools to do that. So we have a tool team and then they use common tools for the entire organization. This is one way, but many organizations are vertical uh, organization, which, uh, well, each of them have maybe their own, <laughs> their own particularity, own culture yeah. and things like this. So it, it depends. But what I've seen is very often you need to have a different, it, it needs to be a separate team because it needs to have a, it needs to have some, some knowledge, some, you know, experience, some, uh, you know, like, um, autonomy, maybe power, yeah. uh, to, to make decisions, to write the tools and, you know, so uh, there's a lot of companies that include this in the C uh, SRE team or in the DevOps okay. team. Uh, and then that seems to be okay. But I, I, I'd say eventually having your own team makes, makes sense if you don't have two pizza teams. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, because I, I was thinking like it's really good if the developers are in the team that calls engineering because then they know everything. But then in their hand, they kind of test outside the service, oh, how you can oh, grow. Hold on. That's different yeah. uh, because now you're asking when you make the failure injection, who should be, uh, who should be uh, alerted, right? If you ask a developer to chaos engineer his own code, uh, you run into bias here, right? Mm. right? The, the problem is, uh, so... <laughs> You need to, when you make chaos experiments, you need to have unbiased view of the system, right? You need to maybe use someone else outside the organization that, you know, that will, will look at the system and say, okay, we are gonna do one hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And the hypothesis might touch a lot of people. Uh, it might be, okay, how, let, let's, let's do one, right? So I'm a, I'm a chaos engineering leader, I have my team and we're, I uh, say we want to do a, a game day or, a, you know, a chaos engineering day. We pick one hypothesis, right? We pick up one hypothesis and we say, okay, let's bring everyone in the organization and let's sit around the table and discuss first what will happen if my database goes down, right? <laughs> and here there's a problem already because if you ask, as I said, to discuss about it, there's going to be, you know, extrovert versus introvert and oh, extrovert. Yeah. An extrovert will be out loud, we will talk a lot, and then people will eventually converge to the ideas of the extroverts. Um, what I like to do is ask people to write on the paper what they think will happen if my database go down. And then you go into something called divergence. Right? You have so many different ideas. You have so many opinions and views of things, right? Uh, so being extrovert or introvert doesn't count anymore no. because you're writing on a paper. So then you can look at that result of, of my hypothesis. And first you'll realize there's so many hypotheses uh, answered differently. And then you can ask, oh, uh, what's going on? Is like my specifications are not right. Yeah. The documentation is maybe not correct. Or hey, we haven't really discussed that. Never. So, you know, the, already here, you're gonna have a cycle mm -hmm. of maybe actually improving your specifications or documentation, right? So that's the first thing. Once your hypothesis Converge, or you have even while writing on the paper, once it converges, people have the same idea that yeah, my system is going to be resilient. It should behave like that. It's time you have a very, a very thorough description of what should happen, how the system should behave, how fast your alert should up, should happen, who should get the alert, what kind of escalation, what the UI should do, what the backend should do. That's then you can do your failure, right? You can do your failure injection and you'll say, okay, let's go and verify this. And then you can think, how do you gonna verify that? Well, if it's a database going down, you can either not shut, shut it down, but then it's dangerous or you cut the connection. You cut the, yeah. you cut the connection. You just say, all right, let's remove the security group. 
uh, and uh, remove the connection, and all of a sudden, you know, your backend can't talk to the master, exactly. but maybe it can talk to the read replica, right? Um, so then you have all the monitoring, you have the the alert systems, you have your response team, incident response team, trying to handle this, monitoring everything, what happens, what's the time to detect, what's the time to... Uh, because that's also important, I think, in the chaos engineer, what you're mentioning now, is not only monitoring the failure, but how the whole escalation of the failure goes. It's actually one of the most important things, right? Because if you don't detect it, you are screwed, right? Uh, so the first time to detect is one of the most important things. And, 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 and I see a lot of companies say, we, don't, we want to do some chaos experiment, and, but let's remove the alerts because we don't want to have noise for people. And I'm like, no, this is what you want. You yeah, want to make sure the alerts are caught on time and they're there. The, people the message are is clear and descriptive. Right. And, <laughs> and then people can identify the mistake first as well. It's the same when you do an experiment like this, you don't say the kind of failure injection you're going to do. Right? You know the hypothesis, but you don't tell the failure injection. So you want the incident response team and engineers to actually figure it out themselves. Uh, so this more than testing is a really like a fire drill. Right. And you want to, you know, <laughs> that's, you know, uh, skill preservation. Yeah. You know, if you don't do that, if you don't debug, if you don't analyze, you have skill atrophy. So you really want, you, when you do a chaos experiment, you don't tell many people in the organization. You might tell the CEO, you might tell your chaos leader, and you know a couple of other people in the team, uh, and then you go and do the experiment and see what happens and all that stuff. Now, when you do this, you do need the big red button in a way. If the system does go wrong, you might want to be rolling back very fast. Uh, so in that case, putting back a security group is very easy. Yeah. This is why I'm saying that you need to think about the blast radius. If your experiment goes wrong, again, it's failure-oriented thinking. <laughs> if your experiment goes wrong, how can you recover, right? And this is when you need to be careful that your failure injection doesn't modify the state, or if it does, can you roll back, and these kind of things. So there's a lot of preparation, and I would say... Uh, that's one of the things that people fail to do is they think over overly think around failure injection, but the preparation is where the money is, right? Yeah. This is the and there's, nowadays there's is, so yeah. many tools to help you to inject failures, yeah. but if you don't know why you're injecting them or what you're doing, right. it's just pointless. Just the before and after, I would say, is even more important than the failure injection itself exactly. because, well, this is where you can do the analysis, you can do the learning, uh, you know, and, uh, and try to gain that, that experience, right? So yeah. that's, that's interesting, that, yeah. That's one of the problems I think I see is, and it's been noted by a few people as well, Nora Jones talks a lot about <laughs> that, that she says like, you know, before and after the experiments are some of the most important lessons are there, right? And, oh, uh, but because when I started planning this talk with you, I have with the idea, let's look at the tool that you have built. This is the cool, but now after we are talking, I'm like, hmm, no, the tool is important, but maybe it's more important this other part. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it, and it is super important. And, and the after is even more important because well, you, you make an experiment, you might surface some failures. What do you do with it? Do you have a mechanism to actually take that learning and to make it into a practice to really fix it? Or is it just going to stay into the, the history and the emails and no one looks at it? So this is the whole purpose of adding a postmortem or, uh, or corrections of error, what, that's what we call it at Amazon, where you know you go through what has been done, you go through your, uh, your results, you go through the measurements you've done, you try to verify that your hypothesis was correct, and yeah. if it's not, then you need to deep dive into the possible cause of why wasn't it why couldn't we figure out the hypothesis right? okay. what's missing what and how to improve it and you know where customer impacted if they were impacted how long they were impacted could it have been prevented was there a backlog item that could have prevented <laughs> the failure very often there is a yeah. backlog you know and then the why is that backlog not 
put in production and oh yeah there's so many things and i love that part uh, because you can you can really focus on different things and and, and again i'll promote one of the posts i've written oh you can promote all your posts i will leave around, <laughs> around operational excellence right a lot of people look at uh, do postmortems in a very uh, tool or engineering way like you know let's do code but actually if you look at the culture part a cultural part of an analysis sometimes it gives you even more learning than you know the tool itself or the or the or the operational metrics uh, so culture tools mechanism yeah. right if you have problems in an organization if uh, there are failures it's always in different in, in across those three dimensions yeah, i remember it's once it dive. was two in the morning when I was a developer and I got an alarm, something was failing and I didn't have access to this, uh, the systems because yep. it was not my role, but it was my role to get the alarm at three in the morning, but it was right. not my role to so get access to So there was a mechanism to... issue here, Exactly, right? but nobody knew, noticed because we only tested when it failed and I was like yep. three in the morning, like what I do, I text my boss and woke him up and then he woke up someone else and then gave yeah. me permissions but by that time it was already six in the morning three hours three hours later wow. later because people needed to wake up it was just like yeah why did not have permissions on why you are sending these text messages to me yeah. if i don't have permission <laughs> exactly and this is not this is purely mechanism right this yeah. is because there are no mechanism to verify that your role that you have the permissions to all the permissions needed exactly to do it was your some, role, right? some new system that like they give permission to the persons that were working on that system but not yeah. all the other senior developers that might need to touch it if things went yeah. bad. And, and you'd be surprised <laughs> a lot of the time the recovery of the systems is because of things like that right yeah. so I, I i remember as well uh, we had uh, uh, okay this was what some years ago i had a customer and uh, he he was let go of the company <laughs> he was working with and took with him the root uh, root access to the aws account <laughs> oops <laughs> well yeah but what do you do with that i don't know <laughs> then the company escalated they couldn't you know the, the, yeah you're they, screwed well uh, th let's say that the process to recover that will, took more than just 10 minutes Let's yeah, 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 because if uh, you lose was, your root access, they managed to recover hard. that. But mm -hmm. I mean, why did this person have the root access, right? So this yeah. is again, it's a process uh, issue, and this has nothing to do with coding skills. It's yeah. but I know. have seen many uh, root co co like uh, accounts for customers that are linked to their Amazon purchase because the CTO goes create their Amazon using like their basic uh, <laughs> account using their I Amazon profile it, yeah. and then it's like that's the root access is like really <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but it happens I have seen it in many startups when I was a consultant it's like maybe not <laughs> yeah so when you do it, when you see this you really need to ask the support or AWS support yeah. to actually do a transfer of exactly. ownership and, and then create a new account and, uh, and make sure that it's not it's not tied to your uh, your business account. It's not tied to your groceries or things like exactly. this. Exactly. Yeah, just. Right. Like but it. I mean, uh, yeah, it's just to give you an idea that things like do go wrong. Actually, that's one of my that's one of my favorite chaos experiment uh, is. And then we talked about the different failure injection, and I mentioned people, uh, you know, at the beginning of the interview. And you can do failure injections on people. Uh, one of my favorite, and this is not me going around and breaking people's neck or anything, <laughs> is like you go in a team and you look at the the different people in the team. There's always maybe a more uh, a developer that has been long tenure that uh, seems seems to uh, let's say a 10x developer yeah. because that's the term people talk about uh like you know a very good developer and you send them on holidays and see what happens. and i send them home <laughs> i take their laptop and i send them home and then you look at how is my uh, and our organization and and the team behaving and you'd be surprised i mean uh, i've done that three or four months ago with a company mm -hmm. uh, six hours we had to bring the the the, the person oh. back urgently <laughs> Poor because guy. I had access to accounts that 
uh, had some special tools to do some debugging. No one else had access. No one actually knew what he was using. Well, to... have you read this, the Phoenix project and the unicorn code? They have the typical developer that knows everything and knows everything yeah. and he cannot exactly. take holidays. And it's like, yeah, I have seen that guy so many yeah. times. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, yeah. you don't need to go and add latency in the system to uh, <laughs> surface failures. Just text one of your developer's laptop and see if the others can actually do their job. Uh, we call that the bus factor. You know, what happened if, uh, if that developer gets hit by a bus? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah but, but I think this, this talk turned, at least in my head, very different than what I was expecting. <laughs> Because it turned into a little bit more like software engineering and architecture in a in a totally different perspective than just technology and and, and right. building things. So it's very interesting. And this is what chaos engineering yeah. is. And and actually, uh, people ask me the benefits of chaos engineering, and I said the benefits are also mostly cultural. Yeah. People think about things differently. They failure oriented. It, we go back to what people call a little bit like uh, business resiliency is uh, how do you think about the overall business how do you make it resilient to failures both in the engineering terms but culturally and then on the tooling side exactly. and, you know there's so many if things. you try to do cost engineering then you end up with a cleaner uh, architecture a cleaner team a more distributed knowledge in the team right. everybody might have the access that they need and like right. all these kind of other things that they are not just like, yes, if my database yeah. goes down, I can survive, but it's bigger than that. It's, it's yeah, like... and, and I mean, as just the, the really one of the main benefits it is you'll end up out of what is sometimes the blame culture, mm. you know, when there are failures, it's very, it was, it used to be, and still is in many organizations, yeah, very, it's very common to try to find someone, it's like, why? What failed? Whose fault is it? And then, you know, it's a reason to fire someone because someone needs to take a, an action on it. But I always say, oh, I don't think anyone wakes up in the morning and go and say, oh, today I'm going to do a shitty job, right? <laughs> so everyone has good intention. So if there are failures, it's again always in the in the dimensions of culture, tool or processes. So. Either you don't have the right culture, as you had, for example, you didn't have the right, uh, the right, uh, you know, codes uh, for, you know, permission. It's a, it's both culture and mechanism. You didn't have maybe the right tool to uh, or uh, training because sometimes people are asked to do training. things and they don't are That's not given process. any training. Training is a process to uh, you know it's part of what we call process or mechanism to yeah. learn a new skill and everyone should go that. So I mean. It's never the human in the middle. It's always around the dimension. Exactly. So you, and, and I think successful, and I'll say in brackets, successful chaos engineering practices in, where that I see of lead to these better, cleaner organizations where there's no more blame, that people are a lot more confident. People actually love working there. Exactly. Uh, and then for developers, being trusted and being a confident is the most important. And if you want to have talent, if you want to recruit talent, it's something you really want to focus on because no one wants to go into an organization where they risk being blamed because, well, <laughs> if you risk being blamed, you're not going to take no. risks. You're not going to go in production trying to fix things. No. You're not going to go innovate. You're not going to, you're going to do as little as possible exactly. to avoid blaming, right? Exactly, and, and, and so that also makes a diverse great. culture because the safer the environment there is, the more people with different walks of life wants to come and work in your company. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not all the friends of the 10x developer <laughs> that work in the same university. Absolutely. So it's, uh, I think it's, it's just more than cost engineering. I think it's just a, makes the, the, the company safer and cleaner and nicer. <laughs> Yeah, you're so. totally right. I mean, and it's not just chaos engineering. I'd say chaos engineering uh, promotes these values yeah, exactly. very, very Surfers highly. Surfers them right. out when they're not working things well. Right, exactly. <laughs> and and you need to have hard debates, right? Because during an hypothesis or then during a postmortem, you you will find situations where well, maybe a framework choice is not correct, uh, code choice is not correct, or the way you've implemented the function or uh, yeah. the class is not 
correct. It's you know the experiment proves this, and you know it's hard discussions because as a developer you write code, you love your code. It's like oh, yeah. oh, don't criticize my code. <laughs> oh, yeah, but you know if you are in an environment where you, you kind of allow those discussion and it's fine. You know, I'm, I'm, I've been in so many roles where I didn't write best code the first time, you know, and uh, yeah, I, and by f- break, breaking it, by making it fail, by yeah. listening to other people's opinion, to uh, getting ideas from others, yeah, then it became better. It's not just me, no. right? I so, know. And, and, and I think this is great, you know, and this is also why I love pull requests because it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's contributing to discussions which improve things and chaos engineering is the same. Exactly. And I like this approach in Chaos Engineer. It totally took me uh, for surprise. <laughs> I hope that the people watching this video also get this uh, idea of a new idea on Chaos Engineering, not just on injecting failures. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just a small part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, and I think it's, it's a really great thing. So let's go a little bit back to our serverless discussions. And oh, you want to break stuff now? <laughs> no, yes, I want to, to, to break some stuff, and I'm interested on in talking on two things, and then we can move to the demo. Yeah. Uh, the first one is Lambda aliases. I love them, but I think it would be nice to see how this uh, can benefit also our testing and our deployments and like chaos engineer tests. Right. And I think that's something it would be nice to, to chat about. All right. So uh, Lambda aliases and API gateway, uh, uh, what is it called? The, the stages. Canaries. Oh, Can- the canaries, yes. Canaries. They contribute to what we called already called immutable deployments, right? And immutable deployment, the idea is that you never make an update on the system live, right? So when you deploy something, it stays there because it's working, right? It's working, it's proven, you leave it there. When you deploy a new version of something, instead of replacing it, you deploy it next to each other, right? And then you send some traffic to the new version of your code, slowly you send 1% of the traffic, yeah. 10%, 20, 30, up until 100. But all this time you do it slowly and you can monitor the. Yeah, I like the, the option paper. for code, de- code deployed and, and Lambda aliases when you do these canary yeah. deployments that you have the alarms. So you can set up like 10 different alarms and yeah. see if something is kind of wrong and, 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 and pay attention to those alarms. And if everything goes well, then it continues yeah. the transfer the whole the traffic to, to the new yeah. deployment environment. And that's great. And Code Deploy does that very beautifully. Actually, yeah. it's integrated in uh, SAM and in yeah. uh, the uh, serverless framework as well. Yeah. Both can do this uh, I through. I have videos uh, on all that. So. Yeah, oh, so you, you, should, you should add the videos here. Yes, I will. <laughs> I love when people do this in the video. You can do it as well. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think I never thought about them in the chaos engineer perspective. I just was thinking about right. the, them as a great well to make sure that everything works before deployment. Yeah, it's called safe deployment. I think yeah. Danilo yeah. as well has a great talk and uh, around the safe deployments. Uh, Danilo is one of our, our yeah. team as well. Link up there. Up there. <laughs> <laughs> I never know on which side the links are, so I was pointed up or down. Or... <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's part of safe deployment. And you can use that technique to make your Keras yeah. experiment safe. Yeah. Because... And you can do that with Docker or ECS, uh, EC2, and I think all kind of different yeah. uh, compute services have the safe yeah. deployments. Yeah, it's called canary deployments. Yeah. And I, again, I've, I've written that extensively on my blog around immutable infrastructures. Mm-hmm. I, 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 Noticed I need to make one special for chaos engineering because linking both is not something people <laughs> uh, do naturally. So I think it's a, it's a good thing maybe that um, that uh, to do this. But yeah, it's the, it's the same idea, right? Is how do you control the blast radius of potential failures and make sure that you only send a small portion of the traffic. So alias is function for lambda exactly. function. It's beautiful for it's that. Beautiful. You you deploy a new version a new version of uh, of your code. And then you create an alias to it and then send some traffic to it. Weighted alias, it's called for uh, Lambda functions. And then. Uh, yeah, and yeah. also the application load balancer has it as well. So Yeah, the ALP yeah. Yeah, gateway has it. Yeah. Uh, Rapt 3 can do it through weighted round rows. It's uh, everywhere. Weighted uh, <laughs> uh, uh, 
weighted routing policies. Stuff so like this. let's go to the demo because we've been talking and I think we can talk for hours. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just going to demo something that I've been yes. working on because I, I had a lot of uh, people in, in serverless asking, okay, how do I inject failures exactly. in serverless? Because it's a managed service and we can't really do anything. So uh, I, I'm a Python developer. That's pretty much the only language I'm I can I can code. I was almost saying good at, but no, I would say I, I can code with because uh, I haven't. Done, I, I don't do it way enough. To, yeah, you know, I to, think uh, eventually we end up not being that great coders anymore after like just doing demos and. and yeah, uh, man, I've, I've <laughs> coded what ten years Python and yeah. I've built pretty much anything on the back end side and stuff like this. But as soon as you don't code twenty four exactly. seven, and you know, uh, so anyway. I, I created okay. a, a I created a small library in Python to do failure injections on AWS Lambda. It initially started as a Lambda layer, but then I, I was like, people have said, no, I don't want to use a layer. So can you make a, a Python library? So now you can just do pip install chaos Lambda, and then. Uh, well, I can show you how it works. And it's actually. available okay. also for Node.js, Gunnar has port. Yeah, so uh, this is, it's available indeed. Um, Gunnar did this uh, for uh, for uh, Node.js, and it's a brilliant uh, it's a brilliant way to uh, add, uh, add failures. So yeah. Gunnar link is going to be there um, <laughs> my, my GitHub account. Yes, I will but, leave all the links down there, but, uh, but I'm just saying it because uh, I only do Node.js because that's the language I feel comfortable. So maybe a lot of people listening to this are Node.js yeah. developers, so it's available the same thing in, in Node.js. But let's yeah, look... similar things. Let's Actually, I think he has one. added one more failure injection. That, uh, so is, and I it's open to... source, this thing. So yeah, if somebody so wants to add more source. things, go for it. Right. Exactly. So you can. Uh, I accept pull requests. So if you want to make some changes, do for it. But I'll uh, I'll make a demo. Let me share my screen yes. a little bit. Let's look at the code. Actually, this is basically how a lambda a lambda function looks like. You see my code, right? Yes. So you know, I would say don't 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 look at all the other stuff, right? Uh, this is my handler function, uh, which. Doesn't do anything, but you can you you could say uh, you could you know uh, console write hello <laughs> do here right so but uh, we are not doing things here uh, for the moment okay so this is my function that returns to 100 and what you can do is you can import for example from lambda and you can inject a bunch of different uh, failures uh, I created a delay some exceptions some status code uh, injections so what you do is just you define which uh, decorator function uh, you want to decorate your handler with. Or actually, you can use this for any functions, to be honest, not just for the handler. So you can also inject this uh, failure for dependencies, right? Okay. Uh, so you can, for example, you could do uh, could do something like that. Uh, you know. Uh, and can you add the free decorators if you want call, to do the free call things? Three and then uh, call, let's say, call Twilio here, right? And you say my Twilio might fail, so you, what you want to do, oops, sorry. <laughs> what you could do is simply add your decorator function like this. Right? Oh, nice. And, and that, will, uh, that will also inject uh, some, some failure. But for example, here you might want to say uh, delay, so you want to inject some latency in, in, in the call to Twilio. So you can do something like that. And that's actually very, very handy to test uh, yes. different sort of functions, right? So uh, let's so all the code is here on GitHub. Actually, if you go onto my GitHub account, yeah. it's a uh, it's a project that is called uh, Lambda Chaos Functions here. La injection, actually, yeah, yeah. yeah. I will so, leave the link. So oh, we found some security. Oh, you see, I need to update mm -hmm. some of my uh, dependencies. Some of my dependencies. Yeah. So that's great. Actually, I love that feature from GitHub. Oh yeah. Um, so this is my Lambda function that is deployed. So I deployed uh, I deployed the handler with exception, right? So this is uh, this is this one. I can show you handler with exception. Yeah. Is this one? It's the same. So it returns 200 if you if you test it. You know, uh, uh, let's do that. And it's it's fairly simple. Uh, so what the there's a cold start here. So that's why it's called. Yeah. It always you can takes it. a little while the first yeah. time then it's fast. You see, it works pretty nicely. So how the system works is uh, it stores the uh, parameters for a failure injection inside 
uh, system manager. Uh, oh, so nice. There is a, a parameter that is stored in system manager, which takes this kind of uh, uh, format. You can define the delay you want, 300 milliseconds. You can uh, design this if you enable it. You can define the kind of injections you want. You can also define the message, message. you want that uh, to do this. This is very handy because yeah. when you when you do uh, logging and you do scraps on your logs, you can search mm -hmm. for a particular message, for example. Uh, but you know, if you put it, if you enable true like this, for example, and then you store it, then it's immediately available here. Yeah, so you don't need to deploy the function. No, no, it, it exactly. won't fail. And you, know, you can re-enable it, uh, you can disable it. Uh, and I think that's something I, I kind of, I've been trying some of the Chaos Engineers things around that they make you change the code and you need to redeploy and that's kind of painful because you never right. know what you're testing. But I, I like this, that you just change yeah. it from the parameters. The only so. thing you need to do here is really that, right? So you need to import. So you do need to modify your code. Yeah, because, but a little but, bit. But, but then what? it's the same code that you deploy for failures right. or not failures. So. Right, and then... It, it doesn't really add any uh, any uh, big delays, right? So you see the duration is 300 milliseconds, and it's calling, uh, you know, sometimes SSM. There is cache enabled, so you see when there is cache, the duration is 300 milliseconds, and as yeah. soon as you stop it, it recalls the service eventually. So it's using the SSM library from uh, from Alex, right, uh, oh. in our team. So to call uh, to call system uh, uh, the parameter store. All right. So if I deploy that, so we can deploy another one. For example, let's let's do uh, let's do uh, one with status code, right? So if we take that one and I redeploy, so in, I'll I'll call the lambda function like that, and then save. So this this will end. This will return to 100. Okay, that's my. That's my code. And now it will explode. Not now because it's not. It's not. Uh, it's. Oh, it's not enabled. Oh, so okay. if I if I put if I put here true. Now it's going to return to 500 here, you see, and then it will explode. You see. Yes. So it's it still so returns a successful exit, but you see my status code here yeah. in yeah, in the handler is there. Uh, you can do some exceptions, which is uh, some delays as well. So you can handle with delay. So this is the delay one is probably the most uh, the most popular. So when you you do that, but I think that's really cool for testing third party services because. Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. Like, so let's, for example, here we have uh, 300 milliseconds of delay. Let's let's start, let's test that. So it will add 300 milliseconds here uh, in the duration. Of course, now we change the handler. Yeah, so to, have a cold start. But, but with that kind of things, you can ch test, for example, your timeouts in your Lambda. Sometimes you have exactly. it, like by default, it's like, I don't know, six seconds. And then you have a service yeah. that it takes in forever to respond and your Lambda times out. And right. you so don't for realize example, that here, Look, I mean, uh, let's, let's make it fail. You'll see what happened. If yeah. I add 4,000, right? You probably know what might happen here because you're. Uh, I don't uh, know what is your timeout, but maybe. If it's, ah, if... you see. So the timeout you're talking about this timeout here, right? Yeah, the function timeout. The function nine timeout. seconds. So it's fine. It's not going to fail, right? No. But you see, and you'll have you have uh, all this. No. This let's say, if I add, if I add. Ten thousand, then you're screwed. <laughs> If I had ten thousand here, you're right, and that will actually fail the system. So it's a very good, it's a very good way to look how the system will fail. And it, it's not, it's you know, and it's something people always forget. I mean, the default timeout in in Lambda, you see, my task yeah. timeout after nine exactly. seconds. So there you go, you've tested the system, and then you can say, oh, but I want actually more than that. So then you can you just change the timeout. You, you, you can change the timeout. Ooh. Where is my timeout here? No. So you, then you. I'm you, I'm never in the Lambda console, so I'm I never know where things are there. So right. So now you do that, <laughs> and then you can retest, yeah. and then your function will work. So that's you made your code more resilient to failures. For example, if your dependency takes maximum ten seconds to answer, sometimes it happens because it does. of the a database, and you see even 
this is not correct. This is not enough. So that means, you know, wow. they are, they really you should uh, you, you should add more time out than that, than that. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. And I think also these type of things are are helping people to realize that lambdas should do one thing and one thing only. So if you have a lambda that is calling a service, maybe don't do it 20 other things because you might need to increase the timeout of the other lambda. Yes. Well, you don't want to increase the timeout of all your other functions that are doing such small things. Just keep right. them separately. <laughs> so with all this delay, we probably need to have a timeout of 13 seconds here because yeah. uh, otherwise it totally fails, you know. And that's a, that's a long, you know, that's it's a... It's very long. And it still fails. So you see, there's, you even surface some... <laughs> some other problems here. So yeah. my duration here was 10,000. So, I mean, something has gone terribly, uh, terribly wrong here. Yeah. So in, no. a, in a Lambda function with two lines of code. <laughs> What's up? Uh, that in a Lambda function that has two lines of code, like return 200 and stuff oh, this one. code. Yeah, that we, you, we managed to break it in a way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean yeah. that's the funny thing. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's so easy just to, you know, and, and you can also test concurrency. I think this is something that uh, you see here. There's a reserve concurrency yeah. as well. And you see, obviously, this was a limit here uh, as well that we were uh, hitting. And there, like, I mean, that's what's so funny with the chaos engineering. You know, you have little things like this that prevent some silly mistakes to happen. And it, it and they happen here instead of happening in production. You and know. how many times you call an endpoint and the endpoint doesn't respond. So this is not something that you're looking at spacecraft that something. Yeah. No, this is the most typical thing. Latencies, I don't know what is your take, but I think latencies and, and API is not responding might be like the most typical things that people ignore and they will solve like 80% of the problem. <laughs> That's true. I mean, uh, you're totally right. Timeouts, timeouts retry exactly. is uh, probably 80%, 90% of, uh, of all the outages, at least to understand how things work. Uh, it's, uh, it's probably... Uh, because if probably developers cool. learn how to do that properly or with circle breakers or whatever, then they will be saving so much time of their life. <laughs> yeah, no, but that's okay. absolutely true. Yeah, absolutely true. You see, now finally we you got it working. Stuff. Yay! Yeah. How many seconds you have? Sixteen to make? seconds. Uh, Sixteen what? seconds. What? Uh, it's uh, it's pretty violent, isn't it? That's so. crazy. Is that because of the cold start, maybe? That's oh it. well, that, again, you're making an hypothesis. Oh yeah. Here. We need to. Uh, oh. We well, sorry. So we could, uh, you know. It's the whole point. Then yeah, we can exactly. look at the logs. We could look at the monitoring, figure out, okay, what has happened? What are my CloudWatch yeah. metrics here? There is what this is nice tool we were talking last week with Alex uh, about his tune performance with Lambda. And you can yeah. like see the, the, the kind of how yeah. much memory, how much time it takes, how much it costs. And exactly. you can integrate it with this cost testing. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's, that's exactly what it is. So. I think, uh, I don't know, do you have something else to share with us or you have no, everything? But, but I mean, uh, if you have other questions, I think. Uh, I, think I think we are fine. <laughs> but I will no. leave all the links for Adrian in the description box. And you also do some lots of writing and you have a lot of talks around in the internet that people can go and watch you. Yeah. So I think if, and if they want to get in touch with you, what is your preferred social media? Uh, Twitter is fine. I mean, I'm on LinkedIn as well, so people can easily okay. add me there. So I mean, I, I don't have a SLA for answering, uh, <laughs> especially uh, when I'm in writing mode. I oh, usually yeah. remove everything. But I also strongly suggest people to look at Gunnar, uh, uh, Gunnar uh, yeah. talk and, and his stuff because he's, I mean, he's, uh, he's taking it even further, I think, in terms <laughs> of uh, chaos engineering for serverless. That's good. Yeah, I should invite him next to deep dive on the intricacies. <laughs> but but I think we had a really interesting talk. It went to a totally different directions. What this uh, what I had in my mind. So I'm happy because that's the type of of, of things good. I like from this talk. It's not like you have a presentation and I have some questions and we just do that. It's just like organically 
moves yeah. around. And I think it's at least fun for me. I hope for the people watching it's also interesting. Yeah, I mean, I had a lot of fun. Yes. I think it's great as well. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm uh, really happy that uh, you, it went differently than you expected. Yeah. So, that, uh, so that, yeah. you know, it means that it's opening, uh, opening up ideas to everyone, even the best of you, of, yeah. of, like you. <laughs> I've been doing now all talks with, with, with three of you and I have many on plan and I always go to topics that I don't have much of an idea. I have like the, the, the kind of, and, and it's so cool to just listening and ask questions. It's, I feel like it's, I like this interviewing mode. So good. my internal opera is very, very proud. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. But thank you very much, Adrian. It was great awesome. to have you, and thank I you. hope to have you again in this channel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. It's an honor, to be honest. It's great. <laughs> Take you. care. Bye bye. This was the video for today. I hope you like it. If you did, give a big thumbs up. Thumbs ups are super important to keep my videos up on YouTube lives when people give thumbs up. So please do. That helped me a lot. If you have any questions for Adrian, don't forget his contact and everything is in the description box. You can reach him through all the social media and he will be happy to answer your questions. If you want me to interview anybody, just let me know in the comment box below. And if you want to see any of my previous interviews, you will find them again in the description box. You will find the playlist for all the interviews. And I'll see you in the next episode of Uva. Ciao, ciao!